Uh, hello. Uh, this uh, welcome to uh, Tokyo Global Dialogue Three. Uh, this is a session on intensifying U.S.-China competition uh, values and technologies. Uh, uh, as as we all know, uh, this uh, competition sort of tilting towards uh, confrontation between uh, U.S. and China is one of the most salient issues that uh, uh, that we're facing. And, uh, and, and on this session, we'd like to focus on the issues of values and technologies in uh, you know, this uh, competition between uh, US and China. And uh, today, uh, we have gathered uh, five experts uh, to discuss uh, uh, this uh, uh, important issue. Uh, uh, I'm, I am going to sort of read it out in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, the first uh, uh, sort of panelist is Professor uh, Aaron uh, Friedberg, Professor of Politics and uh, International Affairs at the uh, uh, Princeton University. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, sort of a participant from the United States is Dr. John Hamry, uh, President and CEO of the Center uh, for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, uh, two participants from uh, China, uh, Professor Yan uh, 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 Shenton, Professor and Dean, the Institute of International Relations at, at Tsinghua University, and uh, also uh, Dr. Yuan Pon, the President of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, known as KICA. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, 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 Dr. Jose Kokubun, uh, a Professor Emeritus of Keio University, and a former President of the National Defense Academy of Japan. And I will uh, uh, be the moderator uh, for this session. My name is uh, Toshihiro Nakayama. I am a senior adjunct fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs and also a professor uh, at the Keio University. Uh, I, I, I teach uh, sort of American politics and, and, and foreign policy. Uh, before sort of going into uh, uh, you know, and asking uh, the panelists to uh, share uh, uh, you know, their own views, we've asked uh, two questions uh, uh, to the to the panelists and ask them to uh, answer these two questions. I'm, I'm just going to sort of read out for you for your reference the questions that we posed. One is, what are the fundamental causes and issues on which the confrontation between the U.S. and China is based, and how will those factors affect the U.S.-China relations in 2022, in particular in the areas of values uh, and uh, technologies. The second question that, uh, that we pose is a mutual distrust has, th that is between U.S. and, and China has been rising uh, 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 both in the United States and China. What do you think is the amplif uh, uh, amplifying this mutual uh, distrust uh, in these countries? So these are the uh, questions that we posed beforehand. But I guess uh, also uh, we have to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, realize the fact that you know, we're s facing a seeing a serious uh, a situation in uh, Ukraine. And it would be odd to mention, not to mention what's going on in, in Ukraine. Uh, I guess what's, ha what's going on in Ukraine is something that we've, ne uh, we've uh, uh, sort of never it would happen uh, you know, uh, uh, about a week ago or so. Uh, I guess uh, the sheer power is shattering the norms and uh, international order, sort of democratic values, people's hopes, and all that. And making us realize that you know how fragile you know these orders are unless uh, we have the will to defend it. So I'd like to ask uh, you know in addition to the uh, uh, sort of the uh, you know uh, remarks that you pre prepared, I'd like to ask the uh, the panelists, what's your view on what's going on in Ukraine, and what the potential uh, implications are you know for our region. And, uh, and specifically to U.S.-China uh, 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 competition. Because I guess the, uh, the effects of uh, what's going on in, in, in Europe is that although people have been sort of focusing on uh, this competition between U.S. And, and China, inevitably sort of people's sort of interest would be sort of sucked into uh, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, at least for the short term. Right? So... What's the implications to uh, our region and U.S.-China relations? That's the additional issue that I would like you to uh, address uh, if it is possible. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Professor Friedberg, 
uh, you have five minutes, uh, and uh, I'll give uh, the microphone or the camera or whatever you can call it to you. Please, uh, Professor Friedberg. Distinguished group of panelists. Uh, our topic is the intensifying U.S.-China uh, competition in the domains of values and technologies. And I'd like briefly to make three points. First, these subsidiary competitions are parts of a larger rivalry that's been unfolding for some time, at least since the end of the Cold War. And this rivalry has very deep roots. It's not, in my view, a product of misperceptions or misunderstandings or even of the particular policies of this or that US or Chinese administration. Rather, the rivalry is driven by two underlying factors. First, the narrowing gap in material power between uh, the United States and China and situations in which uh, power has long been dominant and another rising power is closing the gap in capabilities have traditionally been a source of tension and sometimes conflict. And second, the widening and increasingly obvious divergence in the character of the domestic political regimes of the two countries. Uh, China's Communist Party leaders have long seen the United States as a crusading ideological power determined to undermine and weaken their regime. And U.S. leaders, and I think to a considerable degree the American people, have come to realize that contrary to their hopes and expectations, uh, China is not liberalizing, either politically or economically, but in fact has been evolving in the opposite direction. Second, the U.S.-China rivalry has accelerated considerably over the course of the past decade. Uh, this process began with the global financial crisis of 2009. Uh, it ratcheted upwards with the accession to power of Xi Jinping, and again, during the administration of Donald Trump. And to oversimplify somewhat, <clears throat> up through the first decade of the 21st century, both the United States and China pursued more or less stable and basically cautious and non-confrontational strategies towards one another. That began to change after the financial crisis, as China's leaders evidently concluded that the United States had entered into a period of sustained relative decline, giving China the opportunity to adopt more assertive policies and advance more rapidly and more openly towards its goals. I think it's fair to say that the United States struggled for a time to figure out how best to respond. But over the last several years, uh, it has shifted towards a more assertive approach of its own from a US perspective, pushing back against what's regarded as China's threatening external behavior, repressive behavior at home, and predatory economic policies. The United States has stepped up military and diplomatic efforts to maintain a favorable balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, taken steps to constrict at least partially flows of trade and investment with China, and begun to criticize quite vocally what it regards as Beijing's violations of universal principles of human rights, uh, and also to emphasize more than was done in the recent past, the gap in values between China's current regime and those of the democracies. And these policies reflect a growing bipartisan consensus in the United States. Finally, uh, recent events in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, in my view, are likely to further accelerate the trend towards intensifying rivalry between China and the United States. The spectacle of Russia invading a smaller, weaker democracy uh, has clearly aroused the sympathy of people in democratic countries around the world, uh, and it's heightened the perception that powerful authoritarian regimes, uh, including China, along with Russia, are prone to aggression uh, and in this perception not to be trusted. And this sent sentiment has been strengthened by the fact that China and Russia have aligned themselves so closely with one another in recent years, including immediately before the Russian invasion. The invasion has also amplified concerns in the democracies about the risks of becoming too dependent on potentially hostile authoritarian regimes for critical resources and goods, primarily energy in the case of Russia, but a variety of uh, minerals and other manufactured products from China. And I think recent events are going to accelerate a process of at least partial decoupling between the US and Chinese economies. The heightened sense of threat following Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine 
is likely also to result in substantial increases in defense spending in the United States and other democratic uh, countries, including, as we've seen, uh, Germany, as well as expanded efforts to cooperate in accelerating the development of a range of emerging technologies and to slow the pace at which these diffuse to China. And although my fellow panelists will have greater insight into what's happening in Beijing, I would expect that observing the extremely powerful sanctions that the U.S. <clears throat> and its democratic partners have imposed on Russia will also give added impetus to efforts already underway in China to lessen its dependence on Western markets, technology, and capital. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Friedberg, uh, for uh, being uh, uh, prompt in time. Uh, and next, I'd like to ask uh, Professor uh, Yan Xuanton of uh, uh, Tsinghua University, please. Um, for this uh, very valuable opportunity and to uh, share my view with uh, this uh, distinguished guest. Well, uh, in regarding the competition between China and the U.S., I will fully agree with uh, Professor um, Freiberg and uh, the um, main reason and the cause of the conflict uh, uh, rivalry between China and the U.S. is the uh, power. That means uh, the power gap between China and the U.S. becomes uh, uh, narrower and the China is uh, 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 increasing its capability and try to catch up with the United States. So this factor will inevitably and uh, uh, related to the um, political power in the world or the power distribution in the world. U.S. will continue to have the dominant power in the world or U.S. has to share its power with the U.S. So this is really related to the international leadership. America want to maintain its leadership, so, so try to every, take every efforts to contain China from becoming stronger and become <clears throat> from the catching up with the U.S. too soon. And in this age, uh, I mean, in the age of the uh, uh, digital, uh, in the digital age, the digital technology is a key element of a national power of the major uh, uh, states. So that's why we see the U.S. try to set a, um, many, take a many, many measures, uh, so-called decoupling strategy, and try to contain China's uh, uh, technology uh, progress. So actually, currently, this competition have heavily focused on the digital technology standard in the future. China and the, both China and the U.S. want to have a, a more influence than the other side on decided uh, uh, the digital technology standard. The digital this standards will become the international norm, international uh, 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 regulations, and to govern all of the economic govern the um, most part of the, uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, life. So I think this, uh, uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, Professor uh, Freiberg uh, about the, the fundamental cause or the reason of the rivalry between China and the US. But I will add a little bit about uh, how specific, uh, the specific feature in the uh, digital age. But then I cannot agree with uh, Professor uh, Freiberg about the ideological conf uh, uh, differences or confrontation between China and the US. And uh, ideological differences or diversities between China and the U.S. for decades, this is a constant. It's not a variable. It not cause it not cause the current uh, rivalry between China and the U.S. And uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and China was a much more uh, uh, ideologically uh, 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 radical than was and China and U.S. improved the relationship during the Cultural Revolution and changed the relationship during the Cultural Revolution when China was uh, really uh, ideological uh, crazy at that time. And now I think China's ideology is uh, much moderate than the Cultural Revolution. 
And China has maintained the socialist system for several decades, since 1949. And the strategic relationship between China and the US sometimes getting improved, sometimes being deteriorated. Well, actually, ideology is just a constant, but it used as an excuse to contain China by the US administration, uh, by the administration or the uh, Trump administration. When they feel they need to take a tougher policy to contain China, so they use the ideological differences as an excuse. When they feel strategically need cooperation with China, they say, okay, the ideology is not a big deal. So this is an excuse. And from my standing, this uh, ideology is just an instrument used by the U.S. for its strategic goal, a strategic goal to contain China, rather than for the purpose, like the, during the Cold War and uh, uh, for the competition between the U.S. and the uh, uh, Soviet Union to expand the democracy in the world. No, I don't think that Biden, neither Biden or Trump administration, and uh, want uh, regard ideology as a goal. It's just an uh, instrument. And the second point is. Uh, I think everyone have to, and also required by the uh, uh, chairman to talking about uh, uh, the war in Ukraine. And uh, I think it's no doubt <clears throat> the war was initiated by the Russia, but actually Russia initiated this war based on the same excuse like the US always use, human rights. And the Russia initiated the war based on the excuse that the Ukraine government bombed the uh, uh, local people in the two states in the eastern, uh, eastern part of the uh, Ukraine. So you see, the ideological excuse used by all major powers for what? For any policy they want to adopt. So being a, a, a academia, I think uh, for the sake of the security, for the sake of the uh, last war, we should won the world and didn't uh, emphasize the role of the ideology. That's not the real thing. So I fully agree with uh, 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 Professor uh, 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 Flipper and the, the war in Ukraine, although it's far from East Asia, but it inevitably have a strong impact on the relationship between East Asian countries. And first, this war has already and uh, escalated the differences between China and the, uh, Japan. And China and Japan take sides with uh, either Russia and the uh, 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 US. And so you see, this, this, uh, power, this uh, stance will inevitably with China and the US, uh, China and Japan cannot improve the relationship and uh, very soon. And uh, second, and uh, there's these economic sanctions will inevitably have an impact on chi China's economy. And China has a, a lot of uh, economic uh, business with Russia. And if this business uh, continue, and uh, China will suffer from this uh, sanction. If China stopped the business with Russia, China also suffered from the sanction because uh, this, uh, the econ economic growth will uh, uh, decline. So both politically and economically, and China and uh, East Asian countries, and all will suffer from this, uh, 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 the war in Ukraine. And uh, the third point from understanding, and this war also, also will execrate the division of the digital world. The world already faces the danger, the digital, Technology and the digital economy may split into two markets and two worlds. And uh, by either American standard or Chinese standard. And this war, from my understanding, will escalate this process. So in the future, the world will be more divided because of the war in Ukraine rather than less. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yan. Uh, you've raised uh, many provocative points that uh, we may come back later about uh, your understanding of the nature of the ideological confrontation. 
uh, 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 you know, the implications of uh, Ukraine to our region, though those are very uh, interesting points, and I, I would like to sort of uh, come back to that later. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Kokubun to uh, uh, share uh, you, your views, please. Professor Kokubun, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. On this occasion, at the third Tokyo Global Dialogue, thank you for the invitation. First and foremost, the situation in Ukraine that could uh, evolve into a major world war is something that I'd like to start with. Especially, I'd like to consider how uh, we should uh, look at the position of China. In, in view of Ukraine situation, the position of China is quite influential in terms of whether the uh, war would escalate or not, and also in terms of influencing um, Putin. Right now, the sound is disrupted. Of course, dialogue is being sought after, but if I put the conclusion first, Ukraine has to give up it's a desire to join NATO. That may be something that uh, has that they want to voice, apparently. But uh, the, because uh, that could uh, be viewed as a political intervention that, or interference, they would not say that in the case of China. Remember that uh, Putin came to celebrate a Beijing Winter Olympic, and uh, they demonstrated their friendly relationship with China. And right after that, uh, this situation has uh, broken out and it is on the eve of the uh, Beijing Paralympics. Therefore, for a Xi Jinping regime, the first and foremost of, uh, for China, the most important uh, the issue for them is to solidly establish the Xi Jinping administration. This is from the interpreter, and sound is disrupted again. Remember that back in 1968, that was about the uh, spring of Prague. Uh, back then, under uh, Brezhnev doctrine, the USSR crashed democratization of Czechoslovakia. Back then, China was under the leadership of Mao Zedong, and uh, the, the, they took rather different uh, their position. That is, from that time on, they started to call Soviet Union as a socialistic uh, the imperialism. That is, the, the major power crushed the small country. That is a tantamount to uh, imperialism, s insisting that the Soviet Union has had transformed into the imperialism. That's what Mao Zedong stated back in 1968. We can't receive sound signal. The construction of shelters and together with that, the most important back then was it to uh, turn to the United States back then. So the spring of Prague was as such so that it became a major trigger, or at least uh, the one of the factors behind the background of rapprochement between China and the United States. Now, the, depending on how the cooperation is pursued, this situation could turn into the uh, closer cooperation relationship between the United States and China. So that's a moment that we are faced with, and therefore that points to the important role of China. I hope that China would be more open in view of a uh, such challenging situation, and uh, if as such was the attitude or policy of China, then the relationship between China and United States could not have deteriorated. So uh, that's uh, what I'd like to refer to in conjunction with China, depending on what kind of attitude they would take as in the case of a resolute attitude that Mao Zedong took back then, the what China is pursuing right now could be viewed as there's something based upon double standard. Frankly speaking, for Japan, 
during Abe administration, we sensed at least the possibility of progress in the Northern Territory issue, and therefore, I was wondering what kind of attitude the current administration would take. But now it appears that uh, they are quite uh, clear. The Kishida administration is on the side of Ukraine and uh, immediately decided on the economic sanction, including financial sanction as well, the sanction on financial sector. And then uh, there was a case of the uh, the hacker attack on Toyota. We don't know whether it is 100% uh, for sure that it was done by uh, the Russian hacker, but uh, the, that's how Japan is involved in. Now, they would say that uh, the about the main theme, the U.S.-China competition, I think this is uh, because of the hegemony over technology. The We remember uh, the similar aspect that was seen back in the uh, 1980s uh, that was uh, between Japan and the United States the economic uh, friction. But uh, the at least the U.S. and Japan uh, were back then and are today still the allies and therefore the, the, the weak relationship between the United States and China has to do with the uh, lack of political trust. And uh, the values are in the background of technology development. What is underneath the values United States expected that China would eventually transform itself into market economy, then to capitalism, and then to democracy. That's why uh, the United States embarked on engagement, but then uh, they consider that uh, their expectation was not met. Looking at uh, the resolutions since last year, when the economy is slowing down, China concluded that uh, the policy by Tian Xiaoping is no longer effective. But this is what we need to reevaluate because now China finds it rather difficult to shift itself to open economic policy and uh, because it would affect uh, the communist regime. And Japan shared a similar view with the United States, except that Japan originally did not expect that much transformation or change on the part of China. The Japan expected that there, there will be gradual change, while well as in the case of the United States, they believed or they expected that there will be essential change uh, by way of engagement. But given the historical background, Japan could not uh, improve its perception toward China. But in terms of relationship with China, Japan expected China joining international community. And based upon uh, that, uh, the motivation Japan has been adopted, adopting a various foreign policies. And finally, about economic security. And sorry, again, the sound signal is disrupted. security or economy? That's the question. Looking at the recent trend, politics, security, or economy, rather than that kind of questions, whether we can the, do a kind of cherry picking, both of them, for security, we should uh, face China but especially in the case of economic security. Looking at the military sector, there are some dangerous ramifications in conjunction with economic development. And in fact, it is ex 
uh, extremely difficult to exclude that completely from economic relationship and therefore economic security and economy. Well, the Japan did not explicitly mention that, but in economy, the conversion into military application is viewed as a threat and China's reluctance to make a disclosure of technology, among others. And finally, I'd like to touch on political insecurity, but uh, this could be discussed in other session. So eventually, that would come down uh, to uh, come uh, that would uh, bow down to Taiwan issue, which seems to be somewhat uh, likened to the situation in Ukraine. So I hope that the China would take a position that could be quite influential in Ukraine. Maybe it is only China that can persuade uh, the Putin out of this war. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. The network connectivity was not uh, the stable. So there is one point that I missed. The You mentioned that uh, the values are the underlining uh, the competition between the United States and China. And then you refer to the essence. And uh, th that's when I lost you. So if you can state that again. So what are the what is the essence of the value? Oh, sorry. Back in 19th century, or 20th century, the the modernization by way of science and technology introduction would not uh, that the destroy uh, the fundamental policies of values of China, but uh, behind the science and technology, there are values, inherent values in science and technology. And th they were about to uh, undermine the uh, regime of China, and that is why they turned it down. But now looking at the current technology, we lost him again. how we can promote open society. We hope that China would open its door more widely, and that's what we expect. I think uh, uh, Professor Kokubun raised a very uh, interesting uh, point that uh, uh, you know, situation in Ukraine and the role China could potentially play would be a defining factor in uh, uh, searching for some kind of, of, of a solution. That's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, not an optimistic view, but potentially optimistic view about how we can manage, uh, uh, you know, US-China sort of competition. Uh, I'm sure there are many sort of uh, arguments about that. But uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kokubun, for uh, prov providing us with a, a very sort of interesting points, uh, uh, provocative points. So next, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Hamre uh, for your view. You have the floor, Dr. Hamre. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'm, I'm honored to have a chance to be with you all. Um, you know, I th it's, a, it's an accident of history that after World War II, the strongest Pacific power was not an Asian country. It was the United States. And, you know, as China has emerged from its very, very long, sometimes sad, you know, history uh, of, you know, when it was under, under, you know, oppression and then through its own mistakes early on, you know, it's just climbed out of the of that poverty, and it's had a remarkable success over these last years. And so, Aaron Friedberg and uh, and Professor Yan are right. Uh, the narrowing of of the power gap is is a major factor here. No question. I have a somewhat different view about the the, the essence of the tension, however. Um, I think there are three major questions that 
uh, that are uh, that uh, are at the core of this relationship. I think the first, and we've answered two of them, but not the third one. The first question is, can the United States contain China? And the answer is no, uh, that is impossible. It honestly hasn't been our position, even though our friends from China say it is, but it's never been our position to contain China. We've encouraged our companies to do business in China, you know. Um, but we can't contain China because there's nobody in Asia that wants to do that. Okay, so that isn't, we know that's not possible. The second question is, can China push the United States out of Asia? You know, and the answer to that is no. Um, you know, the rest of the countries in Asia want us there. So China can't push us out of Asia. So we've answered the second question. But it's the third question that is the core, in my view, of the, the difficulties, the tensions that we have. Uh, and that is, what is the relationship of all the other countries in Asia as the United States and China sort out their relationship? That's the core question, because China views the countries in Asia as politically inferior subordinate nations that should respect China's dominance as a power. And the other countries of Asia look to us as partners or allies, not as subordinate creatures. So the central dilemma and the course of our tension revolves around this. And as China becomes stronger and asserts its strength in the region, countries in the region turn to us, uh, you know, to have some reassurance. That's interpreted in China as containment of them when it's the natural reaction of a hegemon in the region. So there's a, there's a deep structural issue that is at the core of this tension and it's not going to be resolved. You know, this is, there are problems in the world that you can define, but you can't fix. And so you have to find ways to manage them. And I think that's going to be the central challenge is how do we manage this central dilemma that pivots around the relationship of all the other countries in Asia as the United States and China move forward with their relationship. Let me just say a word about, and I'm sorry to go on so long, let me say a word about uh, Ukraine. Um, I have to first admit I was wrong. I didn't think Putin would do this. And uh, I thought he would accomplish all of his goals through intimidation and the compromise people were willing to make to avoid a conflict, but he went ahead with this war. And it is going to change the landscape, I think, quite profoundly. Um, we were, the, the natural competition and tension between China and the United States is already causing a, the foundations of a bifurcation of the international, international economic order. But this war is going to also accelerate the bifurcation of the international political order. And I fear that you know, this, we're now entering into a, a very new phase of rigidity in an international system and its capacity to deal with problems. That's going to be the outcome, I'm afraid. I think Russia is going to be forced to become much closer to China because of this. It'll, the sanctions are going to drive Russia into China's arms on financing. So we're going to see the world now at an accelerated pace become bifurcated again. And I think that's the real challenge that we're having to deal with. Okay, I'm sorry I went so long, moderator. Forgive me. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hamre, uh, for uh, your sort of very wise words. And I've noticed uh, the pin of uh, Ukraine on your label, and I, I, I think our hearts and minds are with the uh, people of Ukraine, you know, suffering the situation. 
Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for, your, for your comments. Uh, uh, Professor Kokubun, uh, because the communication channel seems to be unstable, I'd like to reach you with the telephone and uh, to secure the co communication network by phone. So, Professor Kokubun, if you kindly respond to that uh, telephone call. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Yuan Pong uh, of Keka for your marks. Dr. Yuan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Professor uh, Nakayama. And thank you for the invitation to this very uh, important uh, platform. And glad to see so many old friends. And uh, recent days, we have two big events. Number one is the 50th, 50th anniversary of our former President Nixon's visit to China. And uh, secondly, it's a uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, military uh, conflict. I want to start from the recent uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, military uh, conflict. Uh, I think our official stand has already been expressed by President Xi and the State Councilor Wang during uh, uh, through different uh, uh, occasions. I, I won't repeat. I just express my personal view on this. Uh, first of all, I want to say that China is not the major player of this war or conflict. The major players are Russia, Ukraine, United States, and the European Union. But it seems that today China be is gradually becoming the new focus. Since China uh, is a decisive factor to influence the process of the war and uh, even to the, the whole result of the war. That's, uh, that's maybe uh, it's a, a good expectation, but China don't have enough you know, role to play in, this, in deciding the process. And the result of the war really depends on, first of all, is Russia-Ukraine negotiation, and then uh, US Russia European uh, negotiation. China can play um, some kind of a uh, role, but it's not a final and decisive role. Uh, secondly, I want to say that uh, Chinese stand on this conflict based on based on three three things. Number one is the international norms. For example, we uh, respect sovereignty, territorial integrity. We oppose both rule and sanctions. And secondly, based on Chinese own national interest, that is, we need a peaceful environment to development. We want to protect overseas Chinese, you know, people, and uh, we want to a uh, peaceful environment for Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, thirdly, it's based on the international reality. The reality is that China-Russian relations now is in, in the best shape in history. And the China United States relations in the worst scenario in history in past uh, 50 years. This is a uh, international uh, reality. So I'm afraid that uh, the, the war is escalation. As uh, Professor Kukuban uh, mentioned, maybe it's a uh, uh, world war is not far from, from us, maybe. And uh, secondly, I want to say that um, the, the, the United States has a very big strategic failure that he lost two major powers simultaneously. He lost Russia. And I'm afraid that America is losing China. So if America losing two major powers simultaneously, I think of from a big strategy uh, view to see, maybe some Americans big mistake, a big strategic failure. Back to US and China re relations. I think uh, the, today the, the relations going, going to uh, uh, today's uh, landscape, I think um, the deep root is because of the power shift. And power is not just a GDP or economic power because uh, even if Chinese GDP is uh, 
77% of that of the United States last year. But uh, we have 1. billion Chinese people. So it's quite understandable, even from a Mark's perspective. Now, coupled with that, I think what worries Mark more maybe is a military modernization and high tech rise. And uh, the most important uh, factor maybe what makes China success is not based on American Western system, but based on the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and the success of the Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics. This is a very big challenge psychologically and strategically to the American strategists, I think. So partnership is a very comprehensive uh, million for me to see the US and China uh, relations. And the cause for the current situation, I think uh, we have many causes. For example, economic competition, <clears throat> geopolitical competition. But besides this rise and fall story, historically, I think we have some specific reasons. Number one is that American always interfere in Chinese internal <clears throat> affairs. So many disputes happen in Xinjiang issue, Hong Kong issue, Tibetan issue, and in particular, Taiwan issue. All those issues, problems, 100% belongs to Chinese domestic affairs and internal affairs. So if someday American stop, or is its, its sanctions or interference on all those issues above, and I think US and China relations were getting much, much uh, better. And another reason I think is uh, always a demonize Chinese Communist Party and our system. Uh, let's think about what a former Secretary of State Pompeo want to separate the Chinese Communist Party from Chinese people. These sorts of things, I think, uh, make the US-China relations in a very bad uh, situation. So my last point is that how to rebuild the mutual trust, mutual trust. I think uh, the reason for the mutual distrust, the, the direct reason, I think, is a lack of context because of COVID-19 and also because of American policy. The both parties don't have enough context, channels, mechanism. This is very bad. So this makes the media decide, decide the, the, the major contents of the US relations rather than the officials, think tanks, dialogues. Even virtual conferences is not, it's not enough than the uh, meeting person. And, this, uh, and the second reason I think is uh, American still lack of deep understanding of the nature of Chinese Communist Party. Not deep understanding of what's the Chinese real strategy and the real intention. So many, uh, uh, we, we do need a very uh, intensive and uh, deep uh, discussion on what's the nature of our, our party, what's the real intention and the real goal of Chinese uh, uh, strategy. This is, uh, I, want to, I want to say, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, for that uh, uh, sort of uh, many provocative points that uh, you've uh, given us about uh, you know uh, nature of U.S. Uh, uh, China competition, and now sort of we we, we have uh, a couple of minutes for discussions uh, among ourselves. Uh, I'd like to pose. I'm not going to try to sum up the discussions because there are so many points addressed, and the uh, the questions that I have uh, uh, to 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 you all is. Uh, before going into the uh, issue of uh, you know U.S. China uh, uh, competition per se, I, I, I'd like to sort of address uh, uh, the issue about Ukraine. Uh, but uh, uh, and this is mainly to uh, uh, maybe to the Amer to American uh, uh, panelists. But is uh, or or would the situation in Ukraine blur American focus on Indo-Pacific strategy or competition with China? That is what we worry. And I guess, naturally, uh, the Europeans are realizing that U.S. sort of power in you know, their part of the world is absolutely necessary. Uh, Germany and France, they were seeking for a sort of security, an independent security policy, not relying too much on the U.S. 
But I guess when they were thinking about that idea, they never sort of imagined Russia acting in that way. I think so there's a new reality that US, is, U.S. power is needed in the region. So what kind of effect that would have on the mindset of American security experts vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, this is a question to the two uh, uh, American panels. And uh, questions to uh, the two uh, panelists from China is that from our viewpoint, it is very, it seems very difficult to justify your good relations with Russia after what they did in Russia, right? Uh, so how can you justify it, right? I've seen uh, 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 sort of China's actions in the UN Security Council and General Assembly. Uh, the message wasn't clear cut. At least that's my impression. So I appreciate it if you can sort of elaborate uh, on this point. And, and Professor Kokubun, you can jump in in which, which, uh, whichever topic uh, you would like. So uh, whoever wants to take the floor, maybe uh, from the, uh, the American uh, panelists first. Do, do you have any uh, uh, views on how it would blur sort of American focus on uh, the Indo-Pacific or competition you, with China? Or the the well, answer may be yes uh, or no. Yeah, no, uh, let me, it, it takes a little bit more than yes or no, but, um, you know, back in, in 2012, when Barack Obama was president and he had the so-called pivot to Asia speech, um, there was a lot of criticism that nothing happened, but there was something very important in that speech, and that was the first time in American history when the United States said that Asia was its first priority, not Europe. That had never happened before. Now, I think that still represents the strategic consensus in the United States, that the most important security issue we face is the rise of China, and we cannot have a power vacuum in Asia. So uh, that, I think, is rock solid, and I think it's, it's fairly consistent across the, the professional community. The unspoken part of Barack Obama's speech, you know, pivot to Asia, was that uh, Russia was now Europe's problem. But I think what we've seen is that Russia became, became much more of a problem. It wasn't so much of a problem in 2012. It's become a problem, and Europe isn't yet ready to handle it. Now, the, the astounding thing of this invasion is that Europe seems to have come awake to the security problem. And to see Germany in the course of three weeks go from sending a thousand helmets to announcing that it's going to add a hundred billion dollars of supplemental spending is almost unbelievable. So this invasion has fundamentally shifted, I think, the landscape. It will make us continue to pay more attention to Europe because we now have to, because of Putin being a much more pugnacious opponent. But it's also finally making European allies stronger. I Again, I think the great challenge is we're going to start seeing a global bifurcation of the, of the international system. So our, and Europe will not be important, uh, forgive me for saying it, will not be important in Asia. You know, we have to be. So you will continue to see the United States put its primary focus on Asia, but we are going to be working, we're, we're going to double down on NATO. Aaron, I, I, I turn to you, Aaron. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the consequences of the shock that's been delivered in Europe is, as John says, a greater willingness on the part of European governments to, from an American perspective, get more serious about their own defense and the Germans being the most important player in this and the, uh, the ones who were doing the least in relation to their total resources. What that means is that in the longer term, 
the United States will not have to devote uh, a, a, as large a portion of its resources to Europe as it might have in the past, because Europe will take on more of the responsibility for its own defense. I think there is a recognition that the Asia Pacific is the central theater for the United States and China is the central challenge. The, the other point I would make is, uh, I guess, two. One, I do think that this shock, which has really only begun to work its way through our system, is going to have consequences in the US for our overall defense budget and force posture. And uh, I would compare it in certain respects to the Korean War. Uh, at that time, an event in Asia triggered a major buildup in U.S. capabilities, much of it focused in Europe. In this case, an event in Europe is going to have an impact, perhaps not of the same magnitude, but it's going to lead to a substantial increase, I think, in U.S. defense spending, much of it focused on Asia. And the last point I would make is the one that I touched on earlier. Um, there is a sense of commonality among democratic countries, large and small, that's been strengthened by uh, the spectacle of this small, relatively small, democratic country defending itself and defending democratic values. And I think that's going to lead to much closer cooperation among the democracies, both in Europe and in Asia. John refers to the bifurcation of the system. I, I think that's probably true. On the positive side, from my perspective, uh, that also means that there is going to be a much stronger democratic coalition, uh, and which will seek to defend our interests around the world in Europe and in Asia. Oh, thank you. Uh, so in, in addition to the question that I've asked about uh, how can you justify your relations with Russia, maybe if you can add uh, uh, some uh, uh, thoughts about what you've learned through what, uh, uh, watching what happened in Europe, you know, uh, uh, sort of U.S. response to Russia, you know, and the coalition against, uh, uh, you know, Russia's invasions. Are you learning, ever, uh, you know, anything uh, uh, from, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, actions from other countries? So, one, uh, how do you see China's relations with Russia? And two, what are you learning from you know, how U.S. is reacting to the situation in, in Ukraine? Especially, I'm sure you've uh, noticed the fact that President Biden has constantly been saying that we're not going to send troops uh, to Ukraine itself. So, so uh, any response from the uh, panelist from China or Professor Kokobung? Hi, Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, China's response to the situation in Ukraine uh, is the, uh, I don't know whether uh, Putin will listen, but uh, the only one which can convince, persuade uh, President uh, Putin, a uh, lot of criticism on President Putin. But the response of China is very important and significant. Please do not forget that. At the same time, we lost the sound signal again. Now, in, wor in one word, it is including Taiwan issue. In the East China Sea, the presence of China is at the core. In Japan, it, there are discussions, a strong discussion that the role will have to be played as things develop. The United States will be involving more in the issues of Europe but uh, there are many domestic issues in the U.S. as well. Therefore, it's not possible for the United States to be involved in all the issues around the world, especially in uh, Asia and East uh, China Sea. The role to be played by Japan is going to be greater. We 
we lost uh, Professor Kokubun again. Now, the issue of Ukraine. Every day, uh, we have flood of information, nothing but uh, information on what's happening in Ukraine. It is not something that's happening in a very distant place. We are thinking that uh, this is something that is very close at heart. In that sense, alliance with the United States need to be strengthened further. And at the same time, a court uh, and uh, other uh, organizations, and we should be uh, strengthening our alliance and cooperation with the countries with, uh, which, with whom we have a shared value. But at the same time, dialogue with China is critical. This year marks the 50th anniversary since the diplomatic relationship was established between Japan and China, and how we are going to take advantage of this opportunity is a key. We lost Professor Kokuun again. Essential path of China will not change. And uh, we, uh, that needs to be shown clearly, not only by words, but in uh, real act attitude. And if uh, the role can be played to stop or to mitigate the situation, be it U.S. or Japan, uh, there will be a great difference vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Professor Kokubun, uh, any response from the two Chinese past, uh, panelists about uh, China's relations with Russia? Because uh, you, can't, you can't hear? You can't hear. Any response? Now it's okay. Now it's fine. Okay. Uh, any response from uh, a Chinese panelists? Because it's a bit difficult uh, for the outside to uh, understand the logic of uh, you know uh, China uh, Russia relations after what happened in in, in Ukraine. So please, uh, if you can elaborate. Okay. Thank you, monitor. Uh, well, I think. Uh, uh, the question seems not very close to the reality. Uh, I'm not so sure. And uh, it's difficult for the world to understand China's policy toward the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And uh, difficult to understand why and uh, China and the U uh, Russia still maintain the uh, uh, friendship. And the first, I think China's policy is not based on the ideology. And neither the US policy toward the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine Ukraine war not based on the ideology. And just now, uh, Professor uh, Freeberg said that this is a coalition of democracy, I thought. Because in the end, the largest democratic country did not join the, the campaign. The Indian votes the same as thing, like China. So I, I don't think that there's an ideology plays fundamental role in the war and in the current uh, stances adopted by different countries toward this issue. This is a security issue. It's because uh, whether we allow and uh, the uh, uh, major powers to cut, have the buffer zone between them or not. So this has nothing to do with ideology. Ideology by now used uh, as an excuse for Russia to initiate the war, and also had already used as excuse for America and what uh, some other these countries join the U.S. and to continue uh, 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 Russia. So ideology by now is an excuse; it's not a real reason. So I don't think that there will be a solid uh, ideological uh, uh, democratic coalition on this issue, and India is a typical case. And also. I think China's policy toward this issue based on its strategic interests. It must be concerned. If the Chinese government is a responsible government for the Chinese people, they must give the first priority to China's national strategic interests. Just like all of the other major powers. For instance, like Japan, you take sides with the US when America militarily invaded Iraq, I doubt whether Japanese people will 
trade the government ask the Japan why we should side with the US when American military invaded a sovereignty country. I think your answer is very clear because you concern strategic relationship with the US, you concern your st strategic interests, the same. China must be concerned its strategic interests with Russia and its own strategic interests. So I think it's a very simple, it's a very easy to understand why China take a current uh, uh, position. The last point I want to make is that, and uh, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Henry, and the china russian relationship were getting closer because of the war. It's not because of China, it's because of Russia. Russia has no other choice. Uh, Russia has uh, been further isolated by the, uh, 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 the major economic uh, uh, powers. And these uh, uh, san economic sanctions, including uh, cut off the, the SWIFT and uh, uh, for Russia's uh, service, it means Russia has no other choice. Even they are not very happy with the China's abstinence at the UN uh, uh, Security Council. They have to, to get in close with China for their own interests. So I don't think Russia fully agree with China. Russia is happy with China's uh, uh, this kind of uh, policy and not give them a fully support to their, uh, do not support their military action uh, uh, on the Ukraine. But Russia still will try to improve the relationship with China for their own uh, sake. Final point is that I think nowadays all of these countries and uh, should consider how to settle down this uh, war as soon as possible, rather than to condemn the other side's of policy, because a finger point can never help to solve any international conflicts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yan. I, I, you know, you, you explain that you know uh, it's not about ideology, and it may not be about ideology, but it is definitely about a sovereignty of a nation and about human rights and uh, democratic institutions. And what Russia is trying to do is establish a sphere of influence uh, using sheer power. And if that, if China is not uh, uncomfortable about that, I think it will be sending a wrong message to your Asian neighbors. So that's uh, my uh, personal impression. I was ordered by the Secretariat to go into the uh, questions and answers session. So, Although I wanted to discuss about the road of ideology, and I'm sure Professor Friedberg has his comments, but uh, since we're uh, limited, I'd like to sort of uh, uh, ask you some questions uh, uh, gathered from the audience. Uh, one uh, question that I have from uh, uh, Mr. Walter Sim is that the Ukraine crisis has been discussed and might spill over to the Indo-Pacific and so how credible is the Quad as a grouping to uphold FOIP, uh, free and open in the Pacific, and international norms when one of its members, I guess India, is reluctant to condemn Russia for violating these very norms? Uh, anyone wants to sort of address uh, this issue? I guess uh, the issue of India was addressed briefly, but the question is how effective is, is, is Quad and how can it uphold uh, FOIP after what, what happened in, in Europe, uh, uh, in, in Ukraine? Uh, anyway. Well, let me, I, I, let me just say briefly, um, you know, in India, India's military is still hugely dependent on Russian hardware. I mean, they, they have, ex their military was, largely still uses old Soviet equipment and Russian equipment, they import $2 billion a year of spare parts, okay? So India, and with them having a border dispute now with China, you know, they are not in any position to cut off their primary supplier. So I think we understand that. I mean, I don't think that affects the quad at all because India's transcending security concern is China. So I, I don't think it's an issue, personally. Thank you. Uh, 
Does uh, any other panelist wants to jump in? Please. You're well, uh, first of all, I think the, uh, the Indians' policy toward Russia is an, uh, heavily decided by their strategic relationship with Russia because Russia is the major military supplier of the India. India cannot rely on the, any other substance for that. So that's why. And for their own security interests, and they uh, 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 take the similar stance as China did. And uh, second, India's policy toward China cannot be changed. And because of this war, and the Indian will agree with uh, uh, Henry, they will uh, uh, continue to be an uh, important member of the court. But meanwhile, the in India will also concern how to maintain the balance between the US and China, the balance between US and the Russia. So in the future, I think the Indian's policy will become more cautious rather very, uh, 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 very ambitious. And the third, regarding the influence of the war in, um, uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, spread to uh, the East Asia, I think uh, immediately it will have an impact in East Asia rather than the so-called uh, Indo-Pacific. And because, and uh, at this moment we already see, this problem caused more conflicts between China and Japan and more conflicts between China and uh, Australia. And also at this time, we see that the ASEAN countries have adopted different policies toward this issue. And the ASEAN is splitting. So I think that this issue will uh, further divide East Asian countries. And the third, uh, uh, the last point is that, and uh, everyone will suffer from the war economically. The global economy will have a, a, a lesser uh, energy to grow uh, faster enough. And uh, every country in East Asia will suffer from the war economic. Thank you very much. Uh, any other points on, on this question? If not, I'd like to sort of move on to the second question. This is a question uh, from uh, Professor uh, Ken Endo from Hokkaido University. A bit provocative, but uh, a question to the two, uh, uh, two pa panelists from China is that are there any commonalities and differences between Ukraine and Taiwan uh, in your eyes? Uh, we understand, you know, the, the situation is totally different, uh, but I guess the question is, do you see any commonalities? Are you uh, uh, picking up? anything from what, you, what, what what's happening in Ukraine? Is the question from uh, Professor Kendo of, uh, Ken Endo from Hokkaido University. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Kokubun, I, I guess you can jump in as well uh, if you have uh, some views, please. Uh, please. Uh, <clears throat> this question and the last question, I think, uh, uh, Taiwan and Ukraine are totally different. Taiwan is not an independent uh, state, it's part of China and uh, all, almost all the countries stick to one China policy. So the nature of which is totally uh, different. So I, I, I don't want to uh, say more on the comparison of those two. And back to the last question uh, that uh, I think uh, when we talk about uh, Russia Ukraine uh, uh, situation, don't forget we should take uh, Russian security concerns very seriously. But uh, the, the lesson we learned is that, is that both the United States, NATO, and Europe in past decades didn't take uh, Russia's real security concerns uh, that serious. That's why we, we, we witnessed the five rounds of the NATO East World expansion. And the lesson we learned from this is that today we see AUKUS in, in the Pacific we see quad in our part of the world. And this is a very typical NATO style of uh, uh, situation. So that's why, how do you uh, take Chinese security cons uh, concerns as a consideration? This is very comparable uh, or what we need to repeat. And, um, and secondly, uh, uh, many Chinese uh, raised a question. Joe Biden said he knew Russia is going to to, to uh, attack 
uh, in, in advance. But he also repeatedly said that America won't send any uh, single troops in Ukraine, which means it won't prevent the situation from happening. This very tricky uh, policy left us very uh, uh, concerned that maybe Indo-Pacific is America's new focus, and Ukraine is not. Maybe China is a number one uh, threat. Maybe Russia is not. This is a very big alert for many Chinese that uh, you cannot, on the one hand, uh, blame on China not uh, taking side with America, and the other hand, still sending high rank officials to, to visit Taiwan in this very sensitive moment and criticize China or uh, France. Um, but what I want to say is that we need to think something big. This is uh, what uh, 50 year, years earlier uh, when Nixon visited Chairman Mao, what US and China talking, they didn't, didn't talk too much on bilateral. They're thinking on big events in the world. Today, what we are thinking is uh, go beyond the battle per se. Think about some other issues which alert us most. Number one, those neutral states like Norway, like Sweden, like uh, Switzerland, now give up its uh, neutral position. And the second, like uh, John Henry mentioned, Germany is changing its defense posture in many decades. Those events show that uh, uh, the real hotspot may be not in Asia Pacific, but in Europe. So as uh, Asian countries, Japanese, China, we, we need to learn lessons from this uh, conflict that how to build up a peaceful, prosperous, and secure Asia Pacific don't repeat the European tragedy. This is what we, we should learn from this current uh, situation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yuan. Uh, I was told by the Secretary at the time that the time is up. If there's a urgent desire to sort of uh, uh, say the last word, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds if you have any. Uh, does, uh, 30 seconds. Okay, for yeah. uh, each Professor uh, Kokubun and uh, 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 Professor uh, Yan. So Professor Kokubun, you go first. Uh, no. Thank you. Commonalities versus uh, the differences. There are a lot as to the similarities or commonalities. The the residents will in Ukraine and the, the residents will in Taiwan that matters most for democracy. We cannot ignore them and then take any coercive actions by major powers that should not be tolerated. What I mean is that the because that's a society where democracy prevails, the will of the residents have to be respected most. And also, uh, the uh, Taiwan issue. This is more related, uh, more relevant, and uh, the in fact uh, the Russia is not much in focus, but rather it is China that is in focus. But for Taiwan, as long as we see, it appears that compared to Li Tanji's era, they have been maintaining the policy of keeping the status quo, so they were not quite aggressive or radical in saying something in view of the situation. So for Taiwan situation, status quo, to maintain the status quo, that is most important. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yan, 30 seconds. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Monitor. And if we are looking for the, any similarities, I will say Taiwan is a uh, uh, province of China, just like Donetsk is a state of the Ukraine. If the United States followed Russia's suit and to recognize uh, the independence of Taiwan and send uh, larger scale troops to Taiwan, and it will meet the much stronger military resistance from uh, mainland China. And uh, that resistance, much larger and severe than the Ukraine's uh, policy towards the uh, a Russian's uh, uh, action. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to ignore the order from the uh, Secretariat and give the, la uh, sort of the last word to uh, Professor Friedberg. You have 30 seconds. 
Thank you. Uh, I just want to insist on the importance of ideology. We may prefer to imagine a simplified world in which people's beliefs and emotions don't matter and it's all a matter of calculation of state interest, but that's not the way the world really works. Uh, and if you, again, if you look at the reaction in the US and other democratic countries to what's happening in Ukraine, it has a great deal to do with the nature of the Ukrainian regime. If you imagine what the reaction would be if China were to take military action against Taiwan, the reaction similarly would have to do with the perception that Taiwan uh, is a functioning democracy, uh, and that will generate a great deal of sympathy and an inclination to resist what will be perceived as aggression. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Friedberg. Uh, I apologize to the panelists that I wasn't uh, effective in managing the time. But I think we did touch upon very uh, uh, important points uh, and many sort of food for thoughts uh, in, in sort of deepening our understanding of the issue. So again, uh, thank you very much. And I hope to see you in person next year uh, for, for the Tokyo Dialogue uh, 4, hopefully. Thank you very much. The session is over.